Today's episode of the Goldcast is sponsored by Paper. Are you tired of the technological advances that having a computer is bringing you daily? All of the conveniences, the opportunities, the abilities to do things you could never do before? Well, if you're tired of that stuff, because I know I am, then try Paper. Available everywhere, still. Raymond, before we get started, why don't you tell them where they can find us? You can like us on facebook.com slash the goldcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at the goldcast underscore, as well as follow us on Instagram at the goldcast. You can also subscribe to us via iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same moniker of the goldcast. And be sure to be sure to subscribe on the latter three platforms because that way you'll get notifications each time we go live with our new episodes. Boom. All right. Goldcast is back. We're in the building. This is going to be a recap of a frustrating preseason game two. And I know it was it was frustrating. It was definitely frustrating. But, you know, and I mean, I know it's preseason, but it was still still was frustrating. That's what I meant to say. Anyways, here we go. Goldcast. Let's get busy. San Francisco, are you ready? This is the Gold Cast. <laughs> Boom! Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the faithful. I'm your host, Rudy Solis III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Solis the first, baby. Boom. We're back. We're back like the Terminator, baby. Here we go. Preseason game two in the building. What a lackluster attempt by the San Francisco 49ers first team offense. Anyways, oh, it no, felt like, first felt team like offense. last season. Oh, man. It did in the penalties. It was like, look, this is all I'm going to say. Get it, get it out of your system now, 49ers. Get it out of your system now. And all of you silly gold cast, gold cast nation that is being super faithful on this idea that we're going to go like 10 and 6 or – Maybe even eight and eight. Just take a look at yesterday's game. Denver's missing six of their starters. Six of their starters. And they're still mopping the floor with that offense. Brian Hoyer was super inconsistent. We're, 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 we'll get into all of that. We're going to get into all that. Well, um, but first, Raymond, I want to start with your expert fanalist. You are the expert fanalist on the show. You're the best in the game, the best in the business, the best at the gold cast. I'm going to start this off by one thing. One thing that our unof- the unofficial member of the Gold Cast, Rudy Solis Jr., our blessed father, he always says this. He says, if you look really good in preseason, chances are you're going to do okay in the regular season. You have a better chance of doing okay if you look really good in preseason. But if you look really bad in preseason... You are not going to cut it at the NFL level. So, Raymond, with that, I give you the mic. The floor is yours. Take us through what you saw in the second game of the preseason. We got to see a lot of action from the first-team offense. I want to know your thoughts. Well, it wasn't too frustrating because it is preseason. So that's that's one thing. There are some areas, though, that do concern me. A, the penalties, although you could split the penalties between... I feel like there was more penalty, there was less penalties in the second half of last game and less penalties in the second half of this game, meaning that the majority of penalties are coming from the projected starters and then our hopeful starters, people that are you know, getting rotated into with the main first team rep guys. So that needs to get cleaned up. That's an area of of concern. And I'm pretty sure it will. This is just preseason is all about establishing rhythm for the starters and then finding out who your, where your depth's going to come from, who are the guys that are going to support your first string players. So, that was a big concern for me. The defense continues to kind of be a bright, a slightly brighter spot than the offense at times, I feel. And even though we got blown out, a lot of that was not the defense's fault. Obviously, five turnovers in the first half, that's huge. 
Hoyer played 20 snaps this time, and then Beathard came in and played much better than Hoyer did. Although he wasn't playing against, you know, he was playing against a, you know, a, a, a very deep Broncos team. Clearly they are deep, but he played very well. One thing about Beathard, I think, um, I feel like that's, this is someone who kind of keeps standing out to me each game. Each game, he seems to get a little bit better. He played excellent this game, especially. I mean, he wasn't great in the drives after his one touchdown drive, but even in that drive, he it was a he was as sharp as he was surgical. He was surgical with the ball, um, especially the pass to Aldrick Robinson, who continued to had another breakout pass play. That's two weeks in a row. Hopefully, he can keep that up in the regular season against first stringers. And then George Kittle finally got some action coming off of his uh, hamstring injury. And he did not do anything to doubt us in his pickup. So him, Kyle uh, Juszczyk, he played well, too. He only had one reception, but he got 21 yards out of that one reception, including a broken tackle. George Kittle was awesome. So these two guys, I think, are going to be pivotal in the offensive passing game, especially in the the one we saw with George Kittle where Beathard kind of fakes play-action fake, then rolls out to his left and then threw a, threw a perfect pass to Kittle, who did not even break stride when catching that. Um, Beathard, the one thing about Beathard I think he definitely needs to clean up is his his pocket comfort. So he is the total antithesis of Colin Kaepernick. So whereas Colin Kaepernick was much more comfortable when he got outside the pocket and as a result was much more prone to jump out of the pocket as soon as there was any sort of breakdown in the pocket or any kind of pressure coming from the pocket, Beathard is the complete opposite. He will just sit there and sit there and sit there. So I think one of the things he needs to work on is to is just evasive skills. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, his I think feel like his accuracy is going to get better and better. I feel like his arm strength is totally comparable with most pros in in the league. And he he's he's going to get better at progressions and defense. He played from in the pro set in college, so this transition into a system like Kyle Shanahan is going to be very very easier for him. You know, it's still going to be complicated because it is the NFL, but I think it's going to be easier for for him versus other quarterbacks who are not coming out of that pro set. And um, the other big area of concern for me was the running game. Carlos Hyde, again, struggled to get going here. I feel like pass protection is great, but run blocking is struggling. So, And that was an issue so let's last talk, year. Let's talk about that just a little bit. That, you know, But, you know, this is – this so far, again – Let's all take it with a grain of salt, Ray, right? Just like you opened up this conversation with. Let's mm-hmm. all take it with a grain of salt. Remember, 49er faithful, we are talking about preseason. We're talking about practice. We're just talking about practice. We got to all take that into consideration. But I agree. The run game really struggled to get going. And if we're going to go forward with Brian Hoyer as our quarterback, we're going to need that run game to be up and running, literally and non literally, pun intended. I thought the offense really struggled to move the ball. The one good thing I'll say, it is it's kind of even Brian Hoyer like after all of the the precision making skills that Colin Kaepernick has struggled with, especially coming in in the pocket, you know, he really struggles with just kind of sur- like you said surgical precision style throwing. Watching Brian Hoyer and Bethard throw the ball it's it's like it's like the, it's like the jump is like going from them to like Joe Montana or something. They look incredible out there. But I think it's 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 been it's been that many years since we've seen somebody really have control of the ball that way. The 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 run they really struggled to establish a run. I did like some of the passing from Brian Hoyer, but the 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 no contact fumble, the weird the weird shuffle side side pass to to uh, Carlos Hyde. Just the the thing that I thought really frustrated me more than anything else were the turnovers, and I thought the turnovers, the defense did everything it could, and and it, and held most of those turnovers to just just field goals. But it did everything it could to put everything it could to put the offense in position to make something happen. And every single time the 49er offense got the ball back, they turned it over and they gave it right back to Denver 
in 49er territory, making it easy for them to score. And and I thought the off, I thought the defense looked good. And I thought they actually the only reason it appeared as though they were quote unquote struggling against the Denver offense was because the 49ers kept turning over the ball. Those turnovers really, really, um, really concerned me. And Hoyer just looked lackluster. I I feel like you've got. He looked a little lost. He looked a little overwhelmed. Now, this is a guy that's supposed to understand the system. He's supposed to he's supposed to be a, a Kyle Shanahan guy. And so far, I feel like Beathard has gone out there and had the calm and the poise and the confidence that I would have expected out of someone like a Hoyer. Beathard continues to kind of slowly rise up the ranks. I wouldn't be surprised if midway Beathard through the season. Beathard is very calm. Him. He is very calm in that pocket. That's what I that's what I mean when I say he's almost too comfortable. Because he'll sit in that pocket, mm-hmm. and he's taken a couple of sacks um, because of that kind of that uh, that complacency. I mean, it's 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 a good. I mean, you want a guy who's very comfortable. He's not afraid to sit in the pocket and throw the ball and take a hit. He just does not care. He's he's very he's very polished in that particular aspect of the position. Whereas a lot of guys, they see something in their peripheral and they're they're boom, they will bolt. They will bolt like, you know, like like a mouse. <clears throat> but Beathard, it just doesn't yeah, – I feel like he's so used to that in Iowa. And I think part, – and he had some injuries, you know, from that kind of – taking those kind of hits. So he'll need to learn how to clean some of that up. He needs to learn to be mo- more evasive, and I agree, especially in the NFL, man. You've got guys coming at you left and right. He has to get more evasive. But it is nice to see – one thing we've learned about the, the NFL is the NFL is not that interested – they're just not that interested in um, read option style quarterbacks. They were in love with them for a couple years, two, three years, and they spit them out and they go back to a traditional drop back pocket quarterback. That is what the NFL likes. That's what works. That is that's the formula that's the most successful within the NFL system. And so you can't get mad about it. You just adapt and go with what works and what what they want to see. So ha- seeing these pocket passers back in the NFL, re- back behind the 49er offensive line, that's a little refreshing. Another good thing I liked, Marquise Goodwin, that boy is fast. That boy is super fast. And he's got good hands. I liked Goodwin. He impressed me. What did you think about Marquise Goodwin? I thought he was great. Um, he kind of reminds me of, he's like a fast, he like, right now I feel like he's, a faster version of Jeremy Curley. And Jeremy Curley was kind of that player for us last year amidst a bunch of mediocre wide receivers. But now that we have higher caliber receivers in there, I feel like he's getting a little overshadowed by Marquise Goodwin because, A, he runs routes really well. And other than that fumble he had where he needed to really secure the ball, uh, you know, it was a combination of not securing the ball well enough and then the DB obviously making a really good play on him by stripping him in the middle of, of the catch while they're in, in air, which is a really good play for Denver on that part. But other than that, I feel like he's beca- he looks like one of Brian Hoyer's favorite targets. I really want to see Pierre Garçon get into that mix. And yeah. I also want to see, you know, um, Aldrick Robinson. I'd like to see him climb the charts, too. And Jeremy Curley as well. Jeremy Curley is a good receiver, too. He was really good for us last year. So I'd like him to kind of continue to build on the momentum that he established last year. So that was the thing. But, I mean, to me, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, I feel like the run game is really – the second half is – the second half of our running game has been better, but we're playing against scrubs. And the first half, I feel like they're really not – you know, punching those holes the way they're supposed to be. This is what's so weird. The 49ers for the last, since from the Harbaugh era to now, the running game really hasn't been that big of a problem. It's pass protection that's always been a big problem. Now, for this year, and last year was it got better, and then this year, the pass protection looks great, and then now the now the running and opening holes the run game looks weak. <laughs> it's, it's it's like it's well, why can't we just get both at the same time? Is that is that are we asking too much, Ray? Are we asking too much out of the universe to just get both at the same time? That part I think I, I think it, it might little, I mean I'm fr- I'm hoping that it's just the preseason jitters, you know, just like being unpolished, no, no yeah. pads, you know, limit limited pad practice, you know, and then once they get into the se- seasonal rhythm. They'll, they'll have all that stuff ironed out. That's what I'm hoping, especially when the starters are going to be in there for a majority of the game versus coming out within like a couple of series or less. 
I'm with you, and I'm hoping that I'm hoping that is the case as well. It's a little bit of jitters. I know that we have a very complicated offense, and you could see the frustration on Kyle Shannon's face. He's like shaking his head. No, you know, he could, he, he's he's just. It's hard to come from Matty Ice and and Julio Jones and the entire Atlanta Falcons super powered offense to come to this 49er one that's at the beginning of a reboot boot. But they had to expect that. It's not like Kyle Shannon didn't know that. But you could clear you could see that he was clearly frustrated. The one of the glaring stats that that concerned me was that six of the Denver Broncos starters were not in that not in those first team snaps at the beginning of the game. Six of their starters were out. And the, the the Denver Broncos defense was still able to to really dominate and and force forty the force the 49ers into a lot of precarious situations. And I thought that was very telling. I, I keep hearing Reese Lewis Jr., our father's words echoing in my head. If you look great in preseason, you're gonna do okay in the regular season. You have a shot. But if you look bad in preseason, oh boy. That is not tra- looking bad in preseason does not translate well into the NFL, and I keep hearing that over and over and over. Man, when I watch the offense, there are bright spots like we talked about. I also liked uh, Victor Bolden Jr. that that kick return back. That kid is fast too, man, and yeah, he's uh, crazy that was a specialty in college. Crazy fast. That kid, I was like, whoa, that was impressive. I think the offensive weapons. There's the issue, right? The issue, the issue is we all knew going into this that Kyle Shannon didn't have a quarterback, and there wasn't a quarterback on the horizon. But the offensive weapons that Lynch and Shanahan have chosen from around the league, from within the draft, look pretty good. The wide receivers look pretty good. The fullbacks look pretty good. The running backs, when they get a shot, when they got a hole, look pretty good. Like off- offensively and defensively, our front office knows what it's doing. It's just going to take time. We just need to build depth, and we, we you know, we're going to have to solve this quarterback issue. And I'm telling you, it's already an issue. I don't know if you do. You feel that way? Let me just ask you flat out. Do you feel that seeing seeing these little things Hoyer's doing? Do you kind of see what I've been saying about how, you know, ma- on a bigger stage, this could be magnified and this could lead to big trouble for the 49ers. Already the the just the way Hoyer is. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you agree with this? I don't because it's one game, it's one series, and Hoyer wasn't the only one to blame. And the the fumble that now, Hoyer see, had, on. I would that's, agree with that's you. the only that's the only time that that's ever happened in his entire career. So it's an anomaly. See, I would agree. I I would okay. I get you on the anomaly. I get you on that one instance. I would agree with you if I feel like that's what I've seen every time I've ever seen him start as a pro anywhere. You know, like the, yeah, but this is, we, this is I can easily go. I can easily go to Chicago. He had no interceptions, six touchdowns, um, over a thousand yards passing in less than half of a season. That that and and that and those stats are complete. You know, the polar opposite of what we saw within his limited time in a preseason game. And that was just last season. Okay. Well, don't forget this is I'm, also I'm the not, guy that he's, he's clearly been... not the second coming of a Steve Young or Joe Montana, but he's yeah. he's clearly a stopgap. Like I said, my optimistics, my optimistic, you know, f- uh, prediction for this team is six and ten. Yeah, yeah. I think at the most, I think at the most six games, we keep, you know, we kind of keep circling the, those same. We, we kind of keep. You and I both have repeated that several times. Several. And here's the thing: if Hoyer has like three or four games in a row that are like this, where he's fumbling and throwing interceptions, then uh, I would not be surprised if you know Kyle Shanahan says this is this is this is too much. Like there, there's he's clearly going to have a threshold where it's like you're you're no longer helping the team win. Now you're hurting us. Now you're 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 helping the other team beat us. And that's and we can't have that yeah. even even at this early stage of, of our rebuilding process. And I wouldn't be surprised if someone like Beathard came in, you know, later in the season. I, I, I'm telling you right now, you can almost bank on it. Uh, we should and, put and, the, Hoyer, put, and here's the let, other thing: uh, Hoyer's also injured prone too. So that would be something I wouldn't be surprised if something yes. like that came about too. He's also injured prone. So who knows? I mean, it, there's a there's a whole, there's a lot of things you know that are just. Uh, you know, there's a lot of risk involved with Hoyer, 
But at the same time, his supporting cast is a lot better than what he had in Chicago. And that includes his coaching staff, too. And those things will help Hoyer because he's like Hoyer is like a Kaepernick where he's not he doesn't make players better if his supporting cast is crappy, although he did do good in Chicago in limited playing time. But if you put good things around him, he has a higher chance of succeeding. I agree. I agree. I think we I think we agree. I think we do. We're just coming at it from different angles. We're saying it in different ways. But uh, but I, I agree in general uh, that he's going to do better. You know, we put him as many weapons around him. But I, I still think I, I was going to say, let's make a friendly wager. That's what I was going to say. Let's make a friendly wager. What's the over under? Let's set the over under at eight games. OK, set the over under eight games over under. Bethard comes in to replace Brian Hoyer. What what's what's the what what are you gonna what are you gonna put it at? If it's gonna happen, we're gonna set the bar at eight games. So is it gonna be over eight, under eight games? I'm gonna say if you had under, to bet. I'm gonna say under, and I'm gonna say the reason will be due to injury, not for poor playing. Ooh. Ooh. So what what would you say? What if you're betting man, betting man? What would you say? I'd probably say six or seven. I think he's he's going to get pretty close. Wow. So you're saying like game six tears like his clavicle or ACL or Achilles. I don't know if it would be that bad. Ankle or something. You know, more like a you know, sprained shoulder or gets something Gets his arm like ripped off. He loses a foot. His foot right, is chopped like off. In a gets an eye, eye gouged out. Accident. Or he bites his tongue off or something. <laughs> Forgets to wear his mouthpiece. <laughs> And, and bites his own tongue off. He bites. He bites a, his own tooth off. Bites his tooth right off. He uh, his foot is chopped off in a sawmill accident. A crazy sawmill accident happens at the forty. Well, now you're so, now you're now day. you're you're comparing it to like you ever seen that movie for the love of the game, Kevin Costner? No, I don't think I have. He literally cuts his Break hand what? on a saw on a saw in that movie. He's a pitcher what's, what's, for the what's, Detroit what's Tigers. For the love of... Okay. And he cuts his hand, and then what he has to like do a big comeback after he cuts his hand? No, he like goes to the hospital and he deals with a, and it's his throwing hand. So he, he's there. There's a bunch of doubt that he'll ever throw again, and so he goes through you know withdrawal and frustration because everyone's saying you know why don't you just hang it up? You've already played like 18 years, you know why don't you just hang it up? And he's like, no way, you know, you know, hence the title for the love of the game because he's like dedicated to it. It's a good flick. It's it's, oh, it's a love know. story. It's a I love story, but it's it's a love story, you know, encased in a baseball movie. Kevin Costner, man, he loves those baseball movies, man. He's all about them baseball movies. I know. Too bad he couldn't bring any of that love to Draft Day. Yeah, too, too bad, bad he couldn't. For well to too bad he couldn't bring any of that love to Postman or Waterworld. <laughs> We're getting way off topic, but uh, but I like it. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say. Six games to injury, not bad. I'm going to put it. All right, I'm going to say. I'm going to say game nine or ten. Oh, so you're betting over. I'm going over. Yeah, I think he I think he goes optimistic beyond. Well, I think it's going to be a brutal ten. You know, it's going to be a brutal ten. At, at the, by the by the time we get to the tenth game, we'll be four and six. And uh, every time Hoyer takes the field, they'll be like boo, 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 boo. You know, they'll they'll be. But I, I'm going to say <laughs> the faithful I'm going to go of, with your act on him by then. Oh my God! Come on, 49er faithful have no patience at all. No, are you kidding me? No way. After everything we've been through, uh, no way. He he could save a child from a burning building. And they'll be like, yay! And the very next week, throw three interceptions, three pick sixes, and they'll be like, boo, screw you. Someone put in the baby. Have the baby play. He's better than this jerk. You know, like, that. <laughs> there, there's no way. There's no way. I, I, say, I say game 10, the night before the game, he is hanging out with Russell Wilson. They're at a sawmill. And they're making statues of themselves, Hall of Fame statues, drunkenly. And he chops his own hand off in a in a sawmill accident, and then boom, he's he's out. Game ten, 
Game 10, Beathard's got to come in. Two full hands, 10 fingers. He's ready to go. The one-handed Brian Hoyer uh, has to retire for a little while, and then he has to build his hand back up, and it's like for the love of the game, but for football in real life, and he instead of he gets like a robot hand. That's that's my bold prediction. That's my hot take. Damn. Straight it's preseason, guys. It, <laughs> it's preseason. It's definitely now here's, preseason. Here's the other one. Do you think Matt Barkley comes in, or do you think C.J. Beathard beats Matt Barkley before the end of preseason? You know, that's the battle, right? I want to see... Uh, I guess that battle is going to happen game four, I would imagine, right? Game four is when we're going to see Beathard versus Barkley, right? B versus B, B and B. Spy versus spy. Yeah, and Barkley, when Barkley came in, he couldn't do much to get us back into the game. No, in the, the whole team, the, the team was deflated too. Yeah, they were deflated. Uh, I'll be honest, I didn't watch the end of the fourth quarter. How did Barkley look? He was okay. He was not as yeah. not as good as Bethard. Yeah, but even under Beathard, to be honest, both, he, didn't, I mean, man, I mean, what, he didn't. He only threw two two passing attempts. Beathard threw as much as Brian Hoyer did. It was mostly yeah. because we had given up. It so it's an unfair assessment because by that point the Niners had kind of given up and we were just trying to run the ball. So Bar- Barkley only yeah. had two pass attempts for ten yards. Beathard was seven of twelve with a touchdown. Brian Hoyer was eight for eleven with a pick, although that pick was more of a strip. Yeah, we'll see. I think the fourth four, fourth game, we'll see. Fourth game, we'll we'll have a we're, we're going to definitely get Beathard versus Barkley, and I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing what happens. I think I don't Joe think Williams keep... and Capri Bibbs will beat out Tim Hightower, especially when he shows up and he nets negative one yards, including a fumble. <laughs> there it is, there it is. So, what do you expect, Ray? What do you expect to see out of Brian Hoyer and the offense this week? Third game, most played game. This is the big one. What do you expect to see? Give us your give us. The I expect whispers. to see a, a big turnaround. I'm gonna say a big turnaround because even though we're playing in Minnesota, Minnesota is not a very good team. So I expect us to bounce back. I think I think we're gonna see good play out of them. I think they're gonna score on the opening drive this time. And I also think the defense is gonna cause turnovers like they did last week against Kansas City. Because we had Boom, zero turnovers well, we're gonna f- against against Denver. I think we had one, actually. I think we had a fumble. You know, it, Aaron Lynch not being in there, Solomon Thomas not being there, you could you could feel the, yeah, the difference. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm still pumped, man. I, I still can't wait to see all those guys. All those guys. Aaron Lynch, Solomon Thomas, Reuben Foster, Navarro Bowman, DeForest Buckner. That is one tough-ass group of dudes. I do not want to mess with them. I can't wait. It's gonna. I cannot wait for the first game to see that defense fully unleashed. I think the defense is going to be a lot better this year. I think we're going to be kind of carried by our, our defense this year. That's definitely my non-bold, just quite. I I I feel quite obvious prediction that they're they're going to be large and in charge. I think so. And uh, the one thing that worries me though is secondary. I feel like the secondary is not only a little bit banged up, but a little uncertain, especially our. Uh, Rashard Robinson, he's hot and cold each week. Each time I've seen him, he's just been hot and cold. Right? Hot he's, and he's cold. Never, he's right? never he's just locked there. down. And and each team we no, play he, continues to challenge him. And you just never know what – and on each – I feel like each snap, you never know what you're going to get with that kid. You, you know, No idea. Yeah. You know, one minute like he's getting Scott burned, next minute like, he hey, looks like he's almost 50, picking him. Yeah. You see, they, I feel like right now – if you were to judge it in terms of you know percentage chance, you say, hey, you've got a 50-50 shot of getting a big play if you challenge Richard Robinson. And so people are like, I'll take that bet. That means out of ten, you yeah, know, ten, like, ten passes his way, I'm going to get you know, I, I, I'm going to get at least five you know decent plays uh, from from him, not from him, but you know, allowed by him. Allowed by him. He's like the if if you're going to rob a bank. He's like the dude, he's like the loose cannon guy that you're not sure you're not sure if he's even going to show up to the heist. Or if he does show up, he might be totally hungover or completely locked in. He's like that loose cannon guy. 
he's like the last guy you add to the heist and you're just doing it as a favor to your buddy because he's uh he's got all the weapons and and you know you in order for you to get the guns you got to have this jack off be part of the team that's kind of he's kind of like that guy he's like the jr smith of the 49ers right now oh ouch jr smith <laughs> well jr smith you're never quite sure what you're gonna get with that guy either yeah, one minute he's brilliant. Next minute you're like, oh man, he's riding around in a scooter, on on the court. But yeah, with that, why is, Raymond, why is decision before, locking him up with all that money? A lot of good that's done you long term. <laughs> exactly. Oh, they're in trouble. I I can't I, I can't wait till we get some trade deal stuff. Then then we'll have a much better idea. All right. So Raymond, before we wrap, why don't you tell them where they can find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ray Solis, although on Instagram it is at Ray Solis 1, R-A-Y-S-O-L-I-S, number one. Boom. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Rudy Solis 3, R-D, Rudy Solis 3rd. So concludes another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the faithful. I'm your host, Rudy Solis 3rd, and with me is my brother, my co-host, Raymond Salisa first, baby. Boom. We'll see you next time. Same gold cast time. Same gold cast channel. This is, is the gold cast.